Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be discussing how to manage the use life of flexible endoscopes through proper tracking and documentation. This is Marianne Drosnock and I'm going to start with the first several slides in the presentation. The objectives for today are to discuss the current guidelines and recommendations related to endoscope tracking throughout the entire reprocessing cycle from pre-cleaning and even pre-procedure use through storage. We're going to talk about different ways to track and the different tracking methods that are available in facilities currently. We're also going to talk about cleaning verification, surveillance testing, and proper labeling and documentation, and how you can determine if an endoscope is patient ready through that proper labeling. So very basically, let's talk about what processing or reprocessing is. Currently, those terms are used interchangeably. Within the current AMI standard, ST91 for endoscope reprocessing, we did land on the word processing, so know that those terms are used interchangeably. And what that means is the steps or the entire process that's carried out for an endoscope or any other type of device that allows it to be safe for the next patient use. So reprocessing encompasses everything from pre-cleaning after the procedure through proper drying and storage and labeling. So why is identification and tracking of flexible endoscopes important and what does it mean? So we know we have to have proper reprocessing records and that those provide the data and identification of trends. We also need those records to show compliance with current regulatory requirements and even for accreditation agency standards. Proper identification and tracking of endoscope allows for identifications of patients in case there would be a reprocessing failure, which would necessitate a patient recall, recall or even um, an infection control outbreak. Tracking is necessary to show that your facility has a quality process and that you have that quality built in up front. And that allows you to accurately capture your data for all aspects of scope reprocessing so that you have that information available uh, should you need it. You should also have a policy in place on how to maintain these records and be able to recall them in case you need them. So why is documentation important throughout the process? And I want to stress how important it is to make sure that you're capturing any data from the process at all steps. So if you're doing it, you should be documenting it. So you have to document not only the process and the actual steps that you follow, but also what the training history is for each member of your staff, what the competencies are, and then also the specific information about the scope. What is its history, its uses, its repair? Anything that you have, have done as far as you know, the steps in reprocessing and, and repair records and maintenance, all of that needs to be accessible as, as well as documented. This is an accreditation requirement. It says that you have to document that education and training of your staff. You have to show competencies and verify that all staff that are reprocessing endoscopes must be deemed competent. That is required by regulatory and accreditation agencies alike. So let's talk a little bit specifically about AMI guidance and the ST91 document. This is the current national standard for reprocessing flexible endoscopes. And within this document, which you should have on hand if you're reprocessing flexible scopes, it does establish a quality assurance and compliance program that's comprehensive and allows that quality management system to be um, initiated and having a proper safety program in place for all assets aspects of reprocessing. It is so important to make sure that we have this quality assurance program in up front and that you're engineering quality in um, to begin with and that it's not an afterthought once you have an issue uh, that we're making sure we do everything on the forefront instead of on the back end. So th some things that are particularly listed in AMI guidance that you would want to um, have your quality assurance program document would be to identify all personnel and those specifically that are reprocessing the endoscope, what facility areas are involved, what your different endoscope models are, what accessories you're using, what your processing equipment is, and those are things like your, your automated endoscope reprocessors or your AERs or your sterilizers if you're sterilizing certain scopes. 
where your storage locations are, and what your maintenance schedule is for your endoscope. You would also want to include in that program all of your process monitoring, um, and such as cleaning verifications and documenting that. You would also want to add in there visual inspections of scopes, and we'll talk about this later in the presentation, but you should now be, according to the standards and guidelines, inspecting your endoscopes for cleanliness and repair issues. You also need to be maintaining records for all of your endoscopes and being able to track those back to the patient that it was used on. You also need to be documenting your, your storage, your length of storage, what your practices are. This is also commonly called your hang time. And what that means is how long a scope can hang in storage after it's been reprocessed. And if it's not used again, what is that time interval that it would have to be reprocessed at? So you need to have that documented and have a way to identify once you've reached that hang time level. You also need to know what to do in the event of an outbreak. You have to have these procedures and policies in place up front that would help you detect or identify an outbreak. And this is your, really your surveillance system and how you would track that back to any implicated endoscope models and, of course, your patients uh, to determine whether you would need to recall them. The next slide here shows you what AORN says about proper documentation um, and building that quality assurance program. Uh, one thing that's different from the AMI guideline, or I should say in addition to it, is AORN states that you really need to be recording the time that the procedure is completed and the time that the manual cleaning portion of reprocessing is initiated. And the reason that's important is there are timelines that are associated with reprocessing. And many endoscope manufacturers, or I should say the major endoscope manufacturer, will have a one hour hold time associated with this. So that's a one hour delay between when the procedure ends, so that's when pre-cleaning is initiated, and when manual cleaning is started. So by documenting the procedure completion time and the cleaning initiation time, you know whether you've exceeded that one hour hold time or not. And we'll discuss this delayed reprocessing later in the presentation, but that really is written into the AORN guidance about documenting that time. The other thing that AORN says that's so important is that healthcare organizations should maintain records of anything to do with reprocessing of flexible endoscopes and associated procedures. Some examples of what they say facilities need to be documenting every time the scope is used in reprocess is, of course, the date, the time, the model and serial number of that endoscope, what accessories were used, the method to reprocess it, was it high-level disinfection, what AER was used what your cleaning verification test showed you. Did it pass cleaning verification testing? That all needs to be documented. As I said, you'd want to um, identify your AER, not just which type is used, but which specific unit, if you have multiple of the same type, or if you use a sterilizer, that needs to be noted. And if you have tests of, of your process efficacy, so things like um, if you're using a reusable high-level disinfectant and you have a test strip which shows you it's above the minimum recommended or minimum effective concentration, you need to uh, document the results of those test strips. Of course, the person that's doing the reprocessing, that needs to be noted in the record. The lot numbers of any of your processing solutions, such as your detergents or your disinfectants, if anything was deemed defective, so if there was a repair issue, it failed leak test, anything like that, that would need to be noted in the reprocessing record. The maintenance of water systems when you change your filters, uh, all of that should be documented, and of course, any accessories that you're using with that scope. Here's what SGNA has to say about documentation, and you'll, you'll see a common theme throughout these different standards and guidelines um, and professional society guidelines is that they're really stressing how important it is to capture all of the data that supports and shows that you've done a quality process. So SGNA says that it is management's responsibility in your processing area to ensure that you maintain proper documentation of your reprocessing activities. And it does give some examples, which we'll go through in a second. But these detailed records are essential for recognizing if errors have occurred. So if you're documenting it, it gives the technician or management a point to think, oh, I didn't do that 
that or I did that incorrectly. So it is so important to understand that creating and keeping these detailed records is essential to know whether an error has occurred. You can also then tie it back to what endoscope was affected by that error and the specific patient that could be at risk. So all of that is contained within the SGNA document. Other things that, that SGNA states in, in their recent guideline that you should be documenting is the date and time, as we said, the patient's name, the medical record number, the physician that's performing the procedure, the endoscope model and serial number or other identifier if, if your facility uh, calls it by a different name, uh, your AER and the model and serial number that's used, and the name of the individual who did the reprocessing. This slide gives you some information on what the Joint Commission says about documentation. And this was a response that was provided uh, through Amy uh, the joint and a Joint Commission expert that states that beginning on January 1st of 2017, Departments must have documentation on hand for those devices, such as endoscopes, at the time of a survey. You have to be able to pull out these detailed records easily and provide them to your surveyor. So it is clear by this, so this slide in this response that the Joint Commission, if they come in they, or when they come in, they'll be asking for it and you'll have to be able to produce it. Just because you say you do something doesn't mean that you actually do it. You need to be providing that documentation that something such as a, a leak test or your cleaning verification test that it actually occurred because if it's not documented there's no proof that it was actually done. And this slide follows up then to what I just said and this is a, a quote there from outpatient surgery. In a court of law your medical record is the care that's rendered. So you have to have that documented in the medical record, all of your steps that you've done and all of your quality assurance parameters to show that it actually was done. And if it's not documented, then it didn't happen technically in a court of law. So this is just to reiterate how important it is to document all of your steps and your quality parameters. So at a very high level, let's take an overview of what is encompassed within the reprocessing cycle. And first step along the way is pre-cleaning. And we'll talk about these in more detail later in the presentation, but this is the first step that serves to remove the gross debris from the endoscope and the channels. Um, and it, it occurs immediately after the procedure in the patient room. After that, the scope is transported to the reprocessing area. And the first step that happens there is leak testing and leak testing needs to be done every time the scope is used and the majority of scopes now can be leak tested so for most of you um, all of your scopes will be leak tested there may be a few people out there that have some older model scopes that aren't leak tested but the majority of the time uh, if it can be leak tested 100 percent of the time it needs to be leak tested after it's passed the leak test, you move on to manual cleaning, and this serves to remove the remainder of the bio burden and patient debris from the endoscope to, uh, to ensure that subsequent steps of high-level disinfection or uh, sterilization can occur adequately. After you've cleaned the scope, you need to, uh, to rinse it to remove that debris and the detergent residue. After it's been rinsed, you'll have a new step in there, a visual inspection, which includes cleaning verification. And SGNA has actually inserted this new step and called it a timeout. So this is your safety stop to be uh, to allow inspection of the endoscopes. You really need to be taking a good look at it to make sure it doesn't have signs of debris or damage. And then, as I said, this does include a cleaning verification step, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. After that. After it's passed cleaning verification, you move on to high-level disinfection. It can still be done manually more frequently or more often. It's done in an automated endoscope reprocessor. Um, after that, it's rinsing to adequately remove the disinfectant that could be done manually, or more likely, it will be done automated by your AER. After that, it is so important to make sure that scope is dried through an alcohol flush and an air purge. The new standards all say compressed air flushing, and we'll talk about that in more detail, followed by storage. So that's a general overview of the steps that are required or the categories for reprocessing, and there are many, many steps contained with each of those. 
So let's start with the pre-procedure tracking and, how, and assigning scopes to patients and why that's important. So this is before the procedure uh, has actually initiated, had been initiated, and you want to assign a scope to, to begin that tracking process. So this is so important because you need to be able to track that scope back to the patient. So, and assigning a scope then from your storage area or your storage room and cabinet from that inventory to that patient in a specific room. And that helps to make sure your supplies are allocated appropriately and that you can show that you have an, a sufficient inventory of scopes to allow uh, for the anticipated demand. And that's now in the different guidelines that say you need to be allocating your time and your inventory appropriately. Uh, and you need proper time for reprocessing. So by documenting all of this, if you're showing uh, that you can't keep up with demand then, and that these scopes are assigned and that reprocessing is, is being performed too quickly or, or it's being rushed through, this is where you start to show that in your facility that you don't have the proper inventory levels to allow for sufficient reprocessing. By doing that, you can have proper scheduling of procedures to meet your inventory levels and demand. Another important uh, item to note is that endoscope reprocessing needs to be performed in the same manner in all locations. Um, and so that's written now into the guidelines and standards that you should have the same procedure being performed. So if you're doing it manually at one place um, and automated at another, that's not that's not okay anymore. We really need to standardize on our reprocessing and our tracking. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Carlos for a few slides, and he's going to talk about the specific uh, device track uh, details for tracking these endoscopes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marianne. Um, so what we do at Device Track, what we'll do is we'll assign a barcode to each of the endoscopes that you use in your unit. This would include any loaner or any consignment equipment. What the barcode does is it allows our tracking system, the ability to track the movement of that endoscope's daily activity, including tracking scopes down to the patient level, giving you a close loop of the entire process. This includes the storage, going to the procedure room, going to the manual cleaning, to high level disinfection, and back into storage again. In addition to validating and reporting each step that has been completed within the process, that includes the bedside cleaning, the leak testing, the manual cleaning, high-level disinfection, and storage. We provide you with touchscreen solutions, giving you the ability to assign the scope to designated locations such as your procedure rooms, your cleaning rooms, your AERs, or your storage. Device Track is a standalone software, and it's what we call an open configuration. What this means is that we can integrate our software with any existing software platforms that you may be using, such as your electronic health records or any ancillary system. We also have a barcoded option for those that are not able to um, link into their EHR or do not want to use our own scheduling module. Thank you, Carlos. So let's talk in more detail about the steps in reprocessing, starting at pre-cleaning. As I said earlier, pre-cleaning is the beginning of reprocessing, and it has to occur every time that endoscope is used. It happens immediately after the uh, after the endoscope is withdrawn from the pre the patient in that procedure room. So it could be in your GI reprocess uh, in your GI patient room or in the OR. But pre-cleaning always needs to occur immediately after withdrawal from the uh, from the patient. And this step serves to remove that gross debris. And by removing the debris and the bio burden from the scope, we help to prevent biofilm from forming in the endoscope. It also serves to wet the channels, and that's very important in those channels that can't be brushed, such as some of the auxiliary channels or an elevator channel. How you do pre-cleaning is going to be dependent on the type of scope or the model and the manufacturer that you're using. So you need to make sure you're doing pre-cleaning in accordance with the endoscope manufacturer's instructions for use and using any cleaning adapters that they 
the IFU tells you to use. Some things that you would want to be documenting at the pre-cleaning step would be the end of the procedure time, as we said, that's in the AORN guideline, a visual inspection, so you should be looking at that scope and making sure that you don't see any repair issues with it. What personnel were involved in that initial pre-cleaning step? What location it was done in? And also the scope information, so what scope and model um, were used for that procedure. Once pre-cleaning is completed, we are then on to what we call contaminated transport. Contaminated transport are those steps from going from the procedure room to your reprocessing area. It can be across the hall, it could be down in central sterile, uh, it could be on a different floor of your hospital, it doesn't matter where it happens, it is governed by OSHA regulations for transport of contaminated medical device. And what OSHA's regulations say is that your container that you're transporting this endoscope in should have leak-proof sides and bottoms, it needs to be puncture resistant, and it has to be labeled biohazardous. Remember, these are, these are extremely contaminated medical devices at this point still. Even though we've done pre-cleaning, it's still a biohazardous item and it's very heavily contaminated. So we need to make sure that we're containing uh, that item it can still be wet or, or dripping, so we need to have that leak-proof sides and bottoms, puncture resistance so that we protect the person that's doing the transportation or any other patients in the hospital from contamination. It's also important that the container should be of sufficient size, that the endoscope can naturally coil. And if you're over-coiling it in too small of a diameter, then you can have repair issues and damage to that scope that you would otherwise not have. So <clears throat> once we've transported our endoscope then, we start in the reprocessing area. The first step is leak testing. And leak testing, as I said earlier, needs to be done every time that endoscope is reprocessed and it serves to make sure that the scope is watertight. And what I mean by that is that, that the fluids and the bio burden, the debris that's in that channel and on that scope won't be put into areas of the endoscope where it shouldn't be. And that help, that then, causes damage, sometimes severe damage to the endoscope if it's used in a leaky condition. But it also is an infection control risk because you cannot be assured that you can adequately reprocess a leaking endoscope. It can hold on to those re the fluids and the, those contain chemicals such as the detergents and the disinfectants, but it also contains infectious debris and organisms from uh, from the previous patient. So leak testing, again, so important to make sure that it's done properly and you'll want to document the following, that the leak test has been performed each and every time, what those results were, and any repair information on that scope. So if there is a failure that needs to be noted and then you also need to have a policy and procedure in place as to what you do or how you reprocess a leaky endoscope. If you've passed your leak test, the next step in the process is manual cleaning, and this is the most important step in the entire process because it, it removes that patient debris and the bio burden, which includes the organisms, from the endoscope, and we need to make sure that cleaning is done adequately or disinfection or sterilization will never be accomplished. And we hear that so often in industry, but I want to uh, express how important that is to make sure that the debris is removed from the scope prior to going on to disinfection or sterilization. You cannot expect that the disinfection or sterilization will, uh, will cover up poor practice because that's not true. And uh, you know, if there's debris left on the scope and, and it can cover up infectious organisms that are underneath, it's not just going to, to automatically kill everything that's there if the debris is still there. For manual cleaning, I'll refer you back to the manufacturer's instructions for use for that endoscope so you know what to do, what can be brushed, what can't be brushed. All channels need to be flushed every time that scope is reprocessed, but what volume of fluid you should use, all of that is covered within your, your endoscope manufacturer's instructions for use. We talked earlier about time delays and noting what time cleaning starts on your scope, and that's because 
Endoscope manufacturers, some of them at least, have a delayed reprocessing procedure where they validate it an hour hold time. So if it's more than an hour between your pre-cleaning and your manual cleaning, then you need to do an extended soak in detergent solution um, to allow for additional time for that debris to loosen so that it can be brushed and flushed away. So I'll refer you to your endoscope manufacturer for that detailed instruction on what to do if you do encounter a delay in reprocessing. Some things you may want to document or some things you have to document related to manual cleaning is what time the cleaning was initiated, of course your endoscope information, your make and your model, the personnel that's doing the procedure, what cleaning solutions are being used. So that's your detergent solution. You may have more than one available in your facility and that's why it's important to document which one you used. Um, many facilities also document the expiration date. So they have evidence that they used the detergent that was before that was within its expiration that it hadn't yet hit that expiration date. The temperature of the cleaning solutions is this is something that your facility might not be doing currently, but the standards and all the guidelines now state that if it has a temperature on the label, and this is your detergent solution at this step, if that label has a temperature range on there that you need to be monitoring it to make sure it stays within that range. You also need to be documenting if it gets below that range or above it what you're doing uh, to mitigate that. So these are the steps in the process that you need to document and also that you're brushing, what brushes you're using, your flushing, if you're using an automated flushing pump, that you're using that and all of the information as far as what your, um, what your daily volume verifications and decontamination steps are when using those automated pumps, all of that needs to be documented. So at this point we'll turn it over to Carlos for more specifics on device track. Thank you again, Marianne. Um, so this is uh, our module for bedside cleaning. Um, what, what we're doing here is we're validating the completion of bedside cleaning of the, the procedure. As you can see, um, we're looking at each scope and wiping down insertion tubes, suction, suctioning the channels, uh, flushing detergent, flushing the air through the channels. What we're doing is really eliminating the process variations while standardizing each step, making it consistent for everybody. Um, what we're doing is we're capturing, in addition to that, we're capturing all time parameters so that everyone's aware of any lag time or any delays in reprocessing. We also have a comments area so that you can identify any relevant information such as scope performance, poor lighting, poor controls. Usually the people that are in the room are the first um, line of um, defense in terms of poor performance for any equipment. Um, prior to going into anybody that's going to be cleaning that instrument. Now anybody that's using um, this software would have um, their own personal identification key. This can confirm that uh, a process has been validated and the completion of a process for a specific step uh, within your reprocess, your reprocessing, um, which includes your bedside um, cleaning, or anything else that you might be doing. Um, this is used in case there's a breaching process or if you have a, a, a particular issue with an endoscope, you can easily identify everyone that handle that scope within the, that process chain. Uh, when it comes to our manual cleaning module, the first step again, as Marianne mentioned, it's leak testing, ensuring that everybody is doing a leak test prior to continuing on um, the manual cleaning of that endoscope. If any, if for whatever reason the scope fails, the manual cleaning, it takes the scope completely out of circulation so that we can um, get the scope out for service. And again, uh, the manual cleaning process, everybody gets their validation key, um, so um, uh, showing that you're moving that scope to the next step. We talked earlier, or Marianne talked earlier about the importance um, of time parameters uh, in terms of reprocessing um, in accordance to manufacturer's IFUs. Time parameters, we'll be able to capture where those scopes came from, how long has those scopes been sitting there. Um, you can also look at determining your workflow, um, putting priorities on certain scopes that have been sitting around longer uh, than they should be. 
um, and then we're all we're all able to capture where those scopes came from. Uh, again, um, you can allocate the right resources or the proper resources. You may need more people in a cleaning room. You may need more scopes. You may need more washers, et cetera. So being able to identify um, where your bottlenecks may be within your GI lab. Thank you, Carlos. The next step in the process is a verification of your manual cleaning. And this is new, uh, or maybe new to some of you that are on the call, but there really is a need to, to verify that the cleaning process has occurred adequately. And that is through cleaning verification tests and through an inspection step. And that's incorporated into all of the guidelines now. SGNA, AMI, AORN, it doesn't matter which one you're following, they all say that you need to be doing cleaning verification and inspection of your endoscopes. Cleaning verification tests serve to indicate if there is residual debris left on the scope and that are those are indicators of patient debris. Common ones that are often used are tests for protein, tests for carbohydrate, test for hemoglobin, or there are combination products available on the market. And these cleaning verification tests will show you if that debris is still left on the scope which could inhibit or hinder disinfection or sterilization from being uh, performed or occurring adequately in the steps later on. I want to stress that these verification tests are meant to be done after cleaning. So after the manual cleaning steps of brushing and flushing are completed prior to your disinfection. And that's to ensure that that debris is removed prior to it being exposed to your chemicals that are used later on in the process. Some facilities will use cleaning verification tests after high-level disinfection or uh, pre-procedure to show that the scope has no debris on it, but you have to realize that these products, including ATP tests, were really validated to be done after the cleaning process, not after disinfection or, or sterilization. So it is um, it is in all of the recommendations, as I said, to do the manual cleaning steps, but what interval do you have to do them at? And that is where the recommendations vary. Amy SC91 says that you should be doing cleaning verification on all of your endoscopes at a frequency of weekly or preferably daily. AORN, on the other hand, says that, yes, you need to be doing it at this regular pre-established interval, but the example they give is with each reprocessing cycle or daily for each endoscope. SGNA also says re regular pre-established intervals, but the frequency to be determined by the facility. So what's common in all of them is that you need to be doing cleaning verification tests and inspections at a regular pre-established interval, but at what frequency is determined then by which standard or guideline you follow in your particular facility. So let's talk a little bit more about the types of cleaning verification tests that you may be using or that you may be investigating to use. And what you'll do to start with in this schematic is you'll take a sample of your channel and you have different ways to do that. On the left is a flush method, on the right is a swab method. So let's start with the left hand side with the flush method. So in order to do this cleaning verification test, you'll flush sterile water through the instrument suction channel through the biopsy channel, right, of that endoscope, and you'll capture that. And then use a dipstick type test uh, to dip into that sterile captured water, and then you wait the labeled time, and you look for a color change on any of the pads. And this test strip looks for residual protein, carbohydrate, and hemoglobin together. And when you see a color change on that pad, it indicates a positive reaction, showing you that there's residue left in that channel. That means then that the test has failed. What you do then is reclean the scope, because remember, these are used after manual cleaning prior to disinfection, and it allows you to have that timeout stop, that you're testing your endoscope, and if you see that there's residual debris through this color change on this test strip, you are able to simply reclean the scope and retest it. The other type that you could be using are the swabbing methods that are shown on the right-hand side. And in order to do this type of test, you'll run a wetted swab through the channel of the endoscope and then cut that swab off into one of the little vials that I have pictured there. You invert to mix and you look for a color change in this chemical reaction. And if you have that color change, it indicates that there is 
residual debris left in that channel of the endoscope. And it may be protein or it may be hemoglobin, depending on which one you choose. It's not a combination test, it's an either or. So you, if you have a positive reaction and you tested with protein, then this shows you that there is protein left in that channel. So those are the two types of cleaning verification monitors that you may use in your facility uh, in order to be compliant with the guidelines that say you need to be doing cleaning verification testing at regular pre-established intervals. Carlos, over to you. Thank you, Marianne. Well, this is our module for capturing um, the cleaning verification. Once again, we're able to capture um, what has happened to that scope, whether pass or fail, we capture it via reporting. If that scope has failed the verification, then it has to go back to manual cleaning, as uh, Marianne said, and the system will prompt you that, so you'll have to do those steps. Um, anybody using the system will have the cleaning verification tab, and again, you can always go back. Your staff will, can reference the products I have used um, on, um, on, the, on the tab itself. And back to you, Marianne. Thank you, Carlos. In addition to the cleaning verification test, the guidelines now say that you should be incorporating visual inspection into your process. And this gives you a chance to take a good look at the endoscope and see is there any residual debris left on it and are there any repair issues. So the guidelines now state that you should be inspecting after cleaning with a lighted magnification, looking at that scope, um, looking at the control head knobs, looking at the insertion tube and the bending section, and so importantly at the distal tip to see are there any signs of residual debris? Have I really cleaned this scope well? And looking at the integrity, so are there any repair issues? Is it buckling? Is it peeling? Are there, uh, there adhesives that are coming apart? Are the lenses scratched? Anything like that? This is your time out to really be identifying any repair issues or a cleanliness issues with that scope. AORN also says you should be doing that do, doing that throughout the process. So not only at in the process, but also after its use and after disinfection or sterilization. Uh, but the other guidelines really say it's after a cleaning verification testing or during that uh, that timeout that you should be visually inspecting it for debris and damage. We know that an endoscope that appears clean on the outside may not always be clean uh, on the inside, and we can't see microorganisms without, uh, without some magnification there. So uh, we do really need to inspect these endoscopes for cleanliness, and that uh, lighted magnification, so proper lighting uh, in addition to the magnification really does help to increase the ability to identify residual soil or damage on that endoscope. In addition to that, both AMI Guideline ST91 and AORN state that you should consider use of a boroscope for internal inspections of the endoscope, and that may be done after the uh, reprocessing procedure is complete, so after disinfection, for example, but that Use of a boroscope and internal inspection is the only way currently to look inside the channels to see if there is any residual debris or damage. Um, so again, part of manual cleaning is uh, a hard stop with the visual inspection. If the scope fails at any point within our program, it will take it out of circulation and you can request for that scope to go for service. Um, the other thing is that you're able to, um, in addition to visual inspection, you might be able to uh, put additional comments um, to that uh, scope just in case there's something else that you want to be notified um, to your uh, repair facility what's going on with that particular scope. Um, so um, this is where you would capture that visual inspection um, and once again part of your manual clean. Back to you, Marianne. The next step in the process is high-level disinfection, and this may be performed manually in some facilities, but more likely it's performed in an automated endoscope reprocesses, reprocessor, or AER as it's commonly called. High-level disinfection is still the standard of care for reprocessing semi-critical medical devices, such as these endoscopes that we're talking about, because they contact intact mucous membra membranes. Remember, per the Spalding classification, sterilization is, sterilization is preferred for these items. 
And we know that sterilization isn't easily achieved or at all feasible for some types of scopes. So high-level disinfection then with an FDA-cleared high-level disinfectant is what's expected prior to its next use. Some things to note, if your AER cycle is interrupted, it needs to be repeated, and all of that should be documented since we're talking about proper documentation. Other items that you would doc you would want to document as part of your high-level disinfection practices are the AER model and serial number that's being used, the scope model and serial number, the personnel that's running that cycle in the AER or that's performing it manually if you're doing that, what disinfectant is being used, what its expiration date is. You'll keep a copy of that printout. <clears throat> if your AER does print out, you need to be documenting that. And the test strip results, like I said, if you have test strips um, as part of your AER or manual process, then those need to be documented. Any maintenance, preventative, or ongoing maintenance records for your AER, those need to be documented. Uh, and also, as I said, any of that disinfectant solution information, what it is and when its expiration date is. Uh, tracking HLD expiration dates, lot numbers, replacement dates, as well as all your serial numbers for your AERs. We'll also get the confirmation of your disinfectants, MEC via your test strips. We track all your exposure times and temperatures via your particular AER. Also, um, we automate your current manual logs, assisting you with becoming a paperless environment. Thanks, Carlos. The next step in the process is drying, and more and more data is coming to light to show how important drying is to keep the scope in a patient-ready state. We know this is an extremely important step in the process, but unfortunately, it's not done adequately in many facilities. And if you look at current literature, you'll show, you'll see that many of the scopes that are being inspected from storage are actually shown to be wet in the channels. So we know that drying is so important, and it's achieved by flowing air through the endoscope channel and also an alcohol flush. The amount of air or alcohol that you would flow through the channel is determined by the endoscope manufacturer's IFU. So you need to do at least that volume that's listed in the endoscope IFU. What's new and in the current guidelines, AMI standards and AORN and SGNA alike, state that you should be following your reprocessing cycle, so your disinfection cycle, with a flush with instrument quality compressed air. So many of the AERs that are on the market actually just do an air purge. They don't do a full drying cycle, and that's why many of the scopes that come out of the AERs are still wet inside. So if you look at the latest guidance, as I said, you need to be following your alcohol flush with a compressed air drying. And the latest research shows that it takes up to 10 minutes of drying with compressed air to get these endoscopes channels completely dry. Now, the guidelines don't tell exactly what you have to use for a timeline in your facility, but I'll refer you to your specific guidelines for more information on how long you'll be flushing your scope or how long you should flush to adequately dry it. And that would be based on what type of AER you're using, what the air purge or drying cycle is in that AER, and also what type of cabinet it's going into. If you, uh, if you have your endoscope going into an air purge or a dry, air drying cabinet that hooks up to the channels, then you wouldn't need to do the compressed air. But if your AER doesn't do a full drying cycle and it's going into a just a regular ventilated cabinet or a HEPA filtered cabinet that doesn't hook up to the channels, then your flush with instrument quality compressed air becomes a very important step in the process. This, uh, capturing this last process before storage, uh, we can either have it um, uh, the option of automated or the manual um, drawing of this endoscope. So again, capturing alcohol flush or your perch uh, forced air um, through your endoscope. Thank you, Carlos. We pick up then with storage of your flexible endoscope. And the current guidelines state that flexible endoscopes should be stored vertically uh, within a storage cabinet with the distal tip hanging freely so that it's not touching the bob bottom of the cabinet. Your cabinet needs to be well ventilated and cleaned according to that manufacturer's IFU um, for the endoscope. 
Your angulation locks need to be in the free position, so they're unlocked, and there needs to be sufficient space between endoscopes, and according to the AMI document, that's to prevent repair issues. It's not that it's, that it's an infection control risk, but you want to make sure that your endoscopes aren't banging into each other, creating uh, needless repairs. Any removable parts, such as your valves or caps, need to be detached from the endoscope to facilitate airflow through the channels, but kept together, and that is for the purpose of having a unique identifiable set. And there are different ways to do that. I have one such way pictured here. Um, but by keeping all of the valves together with the scope, including the, uh, the cap or the air water channel cleaning adapter, for example, that allows the scope and its accessories to be pulled out of circulation if there would be a breach in reprocessing or an infection control risk. I get the question often on how long can I store an endoscope prior to it having to be reprocessed again, and there's no quick answer to that question, unfortunately. Here's what the current guidelines say. Amy ST91 says that your facility should be performing a risk assessment internally to determine uh, what the maximum length of storage should be. And within the document, it gives you a list of questions to go through uh, and a chart to help you determine what your details are to establish that storage length. ARN also says the same thing, that you should establish a multidisciplinary team to look at what your maximum storage time would be that a reprocessed endoscope can be considered safe prior to it uh, without it being reprocessed again. So that, in addition to Amy SC91, say, do this risk assessment, look at your particular details for your facility, and put that uh, storage length policy in place up front. SGNA, on the other hand, says that based on a systematic review of the literature, that if scopes are reprocessed effectively and stored appropriately in a way that keeps them dry and free of contamination, that seven days should be okay for a length of storage for those scopes. But in order to adopt that seven days, you really need to look at your process to determine if they're being effectively reprocessed in accordance with the IFU and current guidelines, and are they being dried appropriately with that compressed air that we talked about and stored in a manner that prevents them from being recontaminated. Back to you, Carlos. Thank you again, Marianne. So we're capturing the storage time of your endoscope. We're looking at the last time a scope was used, the last time a scope was clean, and we have what's called a hang time. So again, uh, different people using different parameters. This is all user refined. Once the scope runs out of its parameters, then it takes it takes it out of the available stage and it puts it into um, a must clean scope prior to usage. So again, capturing all the time parameters as to how long that scope has expired before. Um, and needs to be clean again. One new item that I want to bring to your attention that's now in the standards and guidelines are statements that your endoscopes need to be properly labeled for identification. And what this means is endoscopes need to have a distinct visual cue on them that clearly identifies whether an endoscope has been reprocessed or not. So if anybody walks into your storage room, can they look at a scope hanging there and see that it's been disinfected or it's been reprocessed? If not, then you're not in adherence with the current guidelines. Proper identification of endoscopes, um, that they're showing that they're patient ready and distinguishing them from those who have those that have not been properly reprocessed does help to mitigate infection control risks and um, prevent that uh, the, a use of an item that is still contaminated. And that is so important to make sure that these scopes are properly labeled for identification. Some other labeling guidance that's available in the particular guidelines that you may be following, AORN says you need to have this distinct visual cue that clearly identifies that the endoscope has been reprocessed and it's ready for use. ST91 from Amy says that you should develop protocols that ensure users can readily identify that a scope has been reprocessed and is therefore patient ready. SGNA states that you should have this system in place to clearly identify that a scope is clean and ready for use. 
in these photos, you'll see some ways that scopes are visually identified uh, as being reprocessed. And again, that is for safety and risk mitigation, that anyone walking into that room can look at that endoscope and know whether it's been reprocessed and is ready for use, or whether it has not been uh, through the reprocessing procedure yet. Another important item in the standards are tracking as a set, and I've alluded to this earlier in the presentation. Um, in storage and throughout the reprocessing procedure, actually, you want to keep your valves, any reusable items such as those buttons and valves, your air water channel cleaning adapters, all of it, if it's reusable and removable, it should be kept together with the endoscope as that unique identifiable set. Uh, you can do this through some sort of bag, as I have pictured there, or similar device, and that allows you to keep that endoscope and those other items together as a unique identifiable set. Unfortunately, at this point, uh, the valves don't have serial numbers on them, so there's no other way to track them back to the scope and therefore back to the patient if you're not keeping them all together. And again, this helps if you do have a breach in reprocessing or an infection control outbreak that you would be able to pull everything out of circulation. Circ circulation. And this is in all of the AMI, ARN, and SGNA guidelines state that uh, this tracking as a unique set should be done. What about surveillance testing? And by surveillance testing, I mean looking at your scopes in storage and knowing um, do they have contamination with certain organisms of concern. Right now, as far as culturing and surveillance testing goes, the only thing that's out there for guidance is the CDC method particular to duodenoscopes. And what the CDC states that if you have duodenoscopes in your facility that you're reprocessing, then you want to be um, reprocessing them, but also doing surveillance cultures on them. And the frequency that they recommend is every 30 days or 60 cycles for those duodenoscopes. Other guidance that's out there at this time, unfortunately, there's not a lot. Amy says in their latest guideline from 2015 that there is no recommendation uh, at this time. We did know that the CDC was working on a method, uh, so it was not included in the Amy guideline at its time of release. It does state within ST91, however, that studies have identified that uh, the nature of microbial contamination can be found on endoscopes that haven't been reprocessed properly, and therefore there is value in doing surveillance testing. AORN says that a multidisciplinary team in your own facility needs to look at your details. Do you need to do reprocessing? Um, I'm sorry, not reprocessing, surveillance testing of these endoscopes, particularly the duodenoscopes. And if you do decide, based on this multidisciplinary team, that you do need to surveil or culture your, your duodenoscopes or your endoscopes in general, what method are you going to use? What are you going to do with the results if they're positive? What are your baseline levels in your facility? So those are all the parameters um, that your multidisciplinary team would look, that and look at, and that's all spelled out in the AORN Endoscope Reprocessing uh, Guideline document. SGNA doesn't have particular recommendations either, but it says that you can do surveillance surveillance cultures or culturing in your facility as a method to assess your quality of reprocessing and also to aid in, in identifying if there have been defects that ham such as leaks in your endoscopes that could hamper effective reprocessing. So that's what the guidelines say and know that the way to do this, there are two options, either through traditional culturing of endoscopes, with you, which you're probably familiar with, and there are also now gram-negative test kits available in the market, and one such is called the NOW test, and that looks for gram-negative organisms, which have been labeled as organisms of concern by the CDC, in your endoscopes after reprocessing. So these are, are ways that you can test your endoscopes in storage after reprocessing to show that they have no organisms of concern in there. And Carlos is going to talk about how Device Track will capture that data. Um, much like uh, capturing a the uh, cleaning verification, we also have the module to catch the ERCP surveillance or any other scopes that have the elevator channel or any other scope that you want it uh, put into surveillance. Uh, we'll capture all that information um, and give you uh, notices whether a scope has passed or failed. 
Moving on to tracking repairs, it is so important to make sure that your scopes are maintained in a proper working order or we can risk patient safety. Um, some things that you need to track as far as repairs go, you need to maintain an inventory or a log of what endoscope model and serial numbers you have on hand, what their repair records are, what the disposition is of defective items such as your endoscopes, maintenance of any water systems and the filters that go along with your AERs and anything then for your endoscopes and your endoscope accessories. ST91 states in, in detail that you should be recording your repairs and preventative maintenance records. All of those should be kept for your scopes and for each AER and sterilizer that's used. You need to follow the repair interval that's given for your scope manufacturer and you don't have that for a lot of endoscopes but there are now repair intervals that are given for some duodenoscopes. So if it's in the manual you need to be following that interval. Next then moving on to inspection prior to use. This is an important step in the process to be looking at that endoscope to see is it functioning proper properly before it gets in the hands of the physician or contacts that patient. I want you to know that the information on how to properly inspect and test the scope prior to using it in the procedure is found in the endoscope instruction manual, not the reprocessing manual. And I think that's why a lot of facilities miss the information, but there are clearly spelled out many steps that need to occur after store after the item is retrieved from storage but prior to it being used on the patient and we'll go through some of those quotes there that are taken directly from an example scope instruction manual so this would be in the in the patient room prior to the procedure you need to be looking at inspecting the objective lenses and the light guide lenses at the distal tip and the insertion insertion section for any scratches cracks stains gaps around the lenses or other irregularities you would note that take it out of circulation you need to also be inspecting that endoscope every time prior to use for the air water nozzle is it functioning properly look at it is it uh, does it have any abnormal swelling bulges dents other irregularities you would want to take it out of circulation and not use it on that patient who's soon coming into that room so importantly if you're using a duodenoscope that has the forceps elevator and associated area you want to be visually inspecting that elevator both up and down up side of it and the underside of it while raising and lowering it you want to confirm that that elevator actually moves up and down appropriately that you don't see any foreign materials on either side of that forceps elevator such as debris or any other kind of fluids if you do note debris or damage around that forceps elevator then you need to stop using that endoscope and take your necessary measures to ensure that it's repaired and taken out of service appropriately or we can risk our uh, patient safety. AURN specifically says in their guidelines that flexible endoscopes, accessories, and associated equipment needs to be visually inspected for cleanliness, integrity, and function before use. So this is where uh, we're putting that into play then before it's used again on a patient, as well as when we stated earlier in the presentation, during the procedure and after the procedure, after cleaning and after disinfection or before disinfection and sterilization. So they have many time points when you really should be looking at it. Inspection prior to use is one of those. Once again, capturing all your visual inspections for your endoscopes prior um, to usage or after usage. Um, one of the things that we do is, again, you can schedule your maintenance for your endoscope, schedule your maintenance for your AERs. So you can see down at the bottom, someone have forgotten to put the filters back into this AER uh, once they've completed the, the maintenance. Um, and this particular scope here, um, this scope is actually hanging in a storage cabinet. As you can see, that scope is still dirty. Um, so someone clearly missed uh, the cleaning steps of this scope or went through the entire process and it was still dirty. Um, so what we could easily done with the vice rec is review everyone to handle that scope prior to storage and be able to, um, to address those problems right away. And then the other thing is uh, giving you a, this gives you a high level summary of um, any use of endoscope within your unit. It provides you information such as the times used, the times repair, uh, the times that that scope has been sitting in storage, um, 
uh, the times that it's gone up for repair, and it gives you a cost analysis. So someone that's running a unit, you can actually see where um, your scopes are being used, whether you have 10 scopes, but six of them are your workhorses. So really being able to be efficient with um, your equipment um, and meeting those those uh, bottlenecks that you may have. So once again, um, you may have to address the need for putting more scopes into into um, usage, uh, bringing the same like scopes um, into the unit, um, et cetera. And, and that concludes the presentation. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Our contact information is contained on this last slide. Please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions on endoscope reprocessing or uh, to myself or to Carlos for any device track specific questions. Thank you again.